So they take these really incredible, incredibly drastic measures. They decide to go around the house and they get up on top of the house. I would imagine they had used ropes and such uh, to get him up on the house. They tear a hole in the ceiling of this house and they let him down through the hole. This is a sizable hole, one big enough for them to be able to put a whole cot down in. And they lower him right down in front of Jesus. Now, i got to tell you, that's pretty drastic measures. I'm going to guess today that a lot of you are friends of folks that are members of our church who invited you. And while I'm sure they went way out of their way to invite you, they probably called you or came over to see you or sent you a letter, a card, an email. They did something to make sure you know that you were going to be welcome here today. But here is the thing. I dare say that if you'd have got here and the place had been packed, I doubt that any of them would have tore a hole in our roof and let you down into it. Um, this is the situation. So today, we want to take a look at this <coughs> and see what the situation is that they brought their man, this man to Jesus was all about. Why it was so important to him. I have to think that, that granted they wanted him to be healed physically. During this point in time in Jesus' ministry, he was physically healing people of their diseases. He raised some folks from the dead. He did a lot of different things. But what we are most concerned about is this man's eternal well-being. And so while we're looking at this, we understand that we have a lot of issues that we might want to bring to Jesus Christ. We understand that we might have some diseases that are going on. We might have some financial issues. We might have some emotional needs. Uh, there might be someone with some addictions. There could be a lot of things going on in your life, and you think, you know what? I need to bring this to Jesus Christ because only he can help me with this. But I want you to know this, that while that is a need, and while Jesus Christ is the answer, I want you to understand that those are only temporary needs. Those are only needs that are going to take place in this lifetime. Because regardless of any of that, at some point in time, we are going to leave this world. We're going to die at some point in time. Even if you've been healed of a disease, even if you've, you've had you know, troublesome times and they've been taken care of, all of those things, understand, that's not the important things. What's important is our eternity. And I think it's important to see that and understand that. So today as we examine this, pa this passage, what I want you to see is these friends that brought this man to Jesus, while they understood and knew that, listen, these are, these are needs that only Jesus could take care of. I'm assuming they took their friend to doctors. They probably, you know, used all the herbal medicines that maybe were around and, and able to be used. They probably uh, took him to the local chiropractor, for all I know. But the fact is, they knew that, listen, there was no hope for this guy unless we get him to Jesus. But I have to think that there is a bigger motive, even in their mind, something that goes beyond just healing him physically. There was something bigger than that in that they wanted him to see Jesus. They wanted him to meet Jesus because there's nothing like meeting Jesus Christ and understanding and knowing that, listen, he is our only hope for eternal life. We get so content in this world. We sometimes think, you know, I've got all the money I really need. I don't have to be rich. I've just got what I need. I'm satisfied. I live in a home that I enjoy. I've got family that loves me. And we can look at everything right in this world, and we can say, man, all of those things are a part of my life. I'm perfectly content. I don't need anything else. Here's the problem. This world is not eternal. Amen. There's going to come a day and time where this world will end. There'll come a day and time where you're going to leave this world, and it's important that you understand and know that, listen, beyond this world is an eternity. And where I spend that eternity is dire. It is very important because I need to make sure that whatever takes place here and the decisions that I make here are the right decisions to secure my eternity. Let's read our passage. He says in Mark 2, 1. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive him. No, not so much as a... As about the door, and he preached the word unto them. By the way, I want to stop here for just a second. Jesus never ever showed up, but what he preached the word. That is a really important point. And I need you to understand that listen, it doesn't matter how much 
Your emotions might get away from you. It doesn't matter about the experiences you've had. None of that measures up to the fact that, listen, when Jesus Christ presented anything to the people that were there, it was always something concerning his word. It is the word of God that changes our hearts, changes our lives. Nothing else. It is the word of God that pierces us and causes us to see that, listen, the only hope we have is in Jesus Christ. It's by faith and trusting and believing that word to be absolutely true. Now, I'm going to tell you here today, I have never met Jesus face to face. I have never, I've never seen heaven. I have never been a part of anything that takes place beyond this world and understand I still believe it to be absolutely and totally true because I believe God's word to be true and accurate when he speaks of it. So today when I share with you God's word, it's because this is our foundation. This is what we hear. This is what we believe. This is what penetrates our hearts and penetrates our lives. So he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when he had broken it up, they let him down, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now today we're not going to be dealing with the palsy so much as we're going to be dealing with the forgiveness that God instills. Because this is what is so important in this message. The most important factor that could ever take place in our life is that God forgive us. Now I don't know about you, but there's a lot of things that has happened and taken place in my life that maybe I would not want you to know about. I might would even be a little bit ashamed if you did know some of it. There would be things that have happened that I would have sought God's forgiveness for, and I would continually take those things to God. But understand and know this, that God sees them and knows them, and you're not going to hide anything from him. But the fact is, it's even bigger than that. By nature itself, when we come into this world, we come into this world as sinners. We come into this world with a penalty of that sin. And so what happens is, is there has to be some, there has to be forgiveness on the part of God for that sin. Yeah. It's, it's so imperative that we understand that, listen, if I'm going to have any kind of relationship with God, if ever God is going to hear my prayers, if ever God is going to be able to hear the, the pleas that I cry out unto him, it's because I have fellowship with him. I have a relationship with him. You know, I've shared this so many times. When we talk about a relationship with God, I think we get so confused about what a true relationship is. When we think about a relationship with God, I would think be a relationship that would, would be one who would want to get into God's word on a daily basis so we know what he has to say to us. I would think it would be a relationship where we constantly spend time in prayer so that we can speak our concerns to him. I would think it would be a relationship that we would want to be among God's people and around his children so that we can be included in a part of that family that God would have us to be a part of. And I think about that, and, and we think, well, I don't know how imperative that is, how important that is. Well, husbands and wives, think about this for a moment. If your wife, guys, never ever spoke to you, would you be happy about that situation? If she decided she never wanted to be around you, she spent all of her time somewhere else, would you be happy about that? Now, guys... I know, if she never speaks to me, I'm okay with that, but I kind of like having her around occasionally. I get it. I get that. But, but here's the thing. In our relationship with God, if we truly have a relationship with him, I'm here to tell you we're going to speak to him occasionally. We're going to listen to him occasionally. We're going to want to spend time with him because we love him and care for him and want to be in good fellowship with him. Amen. Same thing is true with him as it is in our own families. So today, when we're looking at this picture, and he tells this man that he forgives him, that is the bigger issue. That is so much bigger even than the palsy, because the palsy is just a lifetime event. But this is eternal. This is eternal. Now, I want you to notice some things. that I've just got three points that I want to make, and I'll get you out of here by noon, so don't panic, okay? I know some of you have never heard me preach. You say, man, this guy's going to go on at 2 o'clock. I don't know. What's he going to do? I'll have you out by noon, all right? And I want you to notice the confidence of these friends that Jesus was indeed the only answer for this guy. 
I mean, they had every confidence in that. If we don't get him to Jesus, he has no hope. If we don't get him to Jesus, there is no way that anything is going to happen. He's going to spend the rest of his life with the palsy. He's going to spend the rest of his life in despair. He's going to be down on himself. He's going to be discouraged. He's going to be in awful shape. And it says that what they did was they brought him to Jesus. And they get there. And knowing what Jesus could do, they don't know if they foresaw how important it was that he also forgive them. I'm not sure they saw that far in advance. They were concerned about the, the physical, but I can't tell you the number of times I've had people call me and say, hey, Barry, can you come and pray for, you know, my brother, my sister, my whoever? They're really doing bad. They're in the hospital or they're doing this. And, and I always ask them, do they know Christ? Do they have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because quite frankly, the more important thing is that they have a relationship with Christ. Whatever your disease is, whatever's going on in this world, it's only a temporary thing. I'm more concerned about the eternal. It's not that I won't pray for them. It's not that I won't pray for their disease. But I'm more concerned about do they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So I want you to notice the confidence here. He says, And when they would come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. They took all these drastic measures just to get him there. I mean, today, as I said, many of you have probably taken pretty big measures to try to get people you love and care for into church today just so you could be here with friends and family. And I got to tell you, there's nothing that you can enjoy more than to see your family in church. I'll just tell you. There is something about that. To those of us who know Christ, it is important to us. And it just is a joy to see folks that we love and folks that we care for in our fellowship. But now here's what happen, happens here. We know Christ, and it's an opportunity to not just be in fellowship with others, but it's also an opportunity to hear about how incredible it is that God can do incredible things. And today, I would hope that God does something absolutely incredible. So in our text, these men are concerned about the palsy. But what they do is when they arrive, all these people are there, and, and, and they know how important it is to get Jesus, to get this man to Jesus. And so they take these measures to get him there. Talking about the effort that they took to really make sure that they got him there and that they heard Jesus and what Jesus had to share with them. And it's funny because they didn't have to say anything when they got him there. Jesus sees it all take place. I, I got to tell you how incredible that would be if this morning we were up here preaching and all of a sudden we hear a bunch of ruckus up above us. And next thing you know, somebody's lowering somebody down into our, our pulpit. First of all, our trustees are going to have a panic attack. Because they're thinking, okay, we're in trouble now. The insurance is not going to deal well with this. And we've got a hole in our ceiling. I hope it doesn't rain anytime soon. So it's probably a big issue, but they didn't care. These guys didn't care what anybody else thought. I mean, imagine, here they are, they get there, and they're trying to get in to see Jesus. People aren't moving. They're like, no, 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 you know, that's tough. We were here first. And so they're trying to get through there with this cot. People are, are not letting them through. They're not making a way for them. They're not going, hey, look, this guy really needs to be there. Let's, go, let's let him in. That's not happening. They said, listen, we've got to get this man in to see Jesus. And so they take the most drastic measures that they could possibly take because they have such love and such concern for their friend that they just never stop. You know, I think that's an important point. In fact, I've shared this before, but most of you know the, uh, the famous magician, uh, Penn and Teller, you know Penn. Penn was, is, a, is an absolute atheist, all right? But a man approached him and shared with him I believe he gave him a Bible or a track or something of that nature. And some of his atheist friends said, I can't believe you would welcome that. I can't believe you would, you would think that's okay. He goes, I don't only think it's okay. I think it was a great thing for him to do. He said, but you're an atheist. He said, yeah, I am an atheist. I don't believe any of it. He said, well, why do you think it's a great thing? He says, if that man believes heaven is real, if he truly believes hell is real, and if I die and I am going to spend eternity in hell, how much must that man hate me to never tell me that? He says, I don't believe it. But if that man really believes that, he must really hate me to never tell me. 
And i got to tell you, that's important that we understand that. If what we believe to be true, if these men believed that Jesus was the only answer for their friend, then they were going to do anything and everything it took to make sure their, their friend gets there to approach Jesus. I am thankful for one, by the way, that Jesus is such a friend. I mean, think about this. What did Jesus do to show that kind of friendship? Jesus is God in the flesh. He could have stayed in heaven. He could have said, listen, they made their own path. It's just the way it is. He could have done that. But he left heaven, came to earth, and became man. Not only did he come and become man, he did so for one purpose. And that purpose was to die for our sins so that our penalty for that sin could be paid. That's why when we ask forgiveness, we can only find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. He paid the penalty. What do you mean he paid the penalty? I use this illustration a lot. My church will bear with me on this. But I, I like that idea or that picture of going to court and you're standing before the judge. And standing before the judge, the judge can't help but impose a penalty because whatever it is that brought us there, we're completely and totally guilty of that. And we stand before him guilty. And he says, you're guilty as charged and here's the penalty. We can't object to it. There's nothing we can do. We deserve it. And then the judge takes his robe off, steps down, stands beside us, and he says, I'll pay that penalty for you. Let me pay that penalty for you. So the penalty that belongs to us, Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary died. He paid the penalty for us. So that all we do now is we come to him and say, he paid my penalty. I trust him. I trust him to forgive me of my sins. His penalty forgave me of my sins. His blood that was spilled on that cross forgave me of my sins, washed me and made me clean. I look to him. I trust him. That's where we are today. Now, we all have that choice, by the way. We can either trust Jesus Christ to have paid that penalty for us, or we can say, you know what? No, I think I'll take my chances. At some point in time, I'll stand before God and I'll pay my own penalty. Your own penalty is eternity in hell because we are not the perfect individual that Jesus Christ was. Only Jesus could pay that penalty. I would never be able to pay off such a penalty. So I trust Jesus Christ. And by asking him and going to him and saying, forgive me for my sins. Jesus could have chosen to remain in heaven, not become man. He could have not died for my sins. He could have not dealt with all the ridicule. He could have not dealt with the humiliation. He could have not dealt with the pain. He could have not dealt with the suffering. But he loved us enough that he did so that we might have eternal life. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. That's Jesus. A second thing is this. There, is, there has to be an expression of faith in Jesus Christ to have that forgiveness. He says this, when Jesus saw their faith, God needs to know that you believe it. I believe you. I believe what you are. I believe that you died for my sins. I trust that. I believe that. I trust it into my heart. It is my faith that brings me to Jesus Christ. My faith that lies in Jesus Christ and what he has done. How did Jesus recognize their faith? I think that's an important issue because if we truly believe Jesus to be our only hope of eternal life then seeking forgiveness for sin, then something has to look different in our life. And by the way, that seeking forgiveness of sin, the Bible calls that repentance. Repentance is a word that simply says, I'm sorry for who I used to be. And dear God, I want you to forgive me for it. And I want my life to be something different in you. So what we find in this is by faith we are to come to him, knowing that we are sinners and asking God to forgive us of our sin, knowing that only his death, burial, and resurrection can give us eternal life, knowing that. And it's by faith that we know that. But it needs to be a faith that other people can see. Now, i got to tell you, these guys had a faith that other people could see. I can't imagine, again, I can't imagine how much faith it took for them to not be concerned about tearing a hole in somebody else's roof. 
about letting a man down into the midst of everybody that's there just so that they could meet Jesus. They didn't care about the consequences. Okay, it may cost us a lot to fix this, but who cares? It may take a lot of effort to get this done, and one of us could be hurt in doing this, but so what? This is our friend. He needs to see Jesus. We may get in trouble with the law. They may haul us away and put us in jail. But my friend needs to see Jesus. Now, i got to tell you that when Jesus sees this take place, there has to be a recognition of faith on their part by that of Jesus Christ to say, these guys have faith. They need to see it in our life, see who we are, see what we are. And overwhelmingly, everybody that was there, those that were standing outside, those that were inside, no matter who they were, where they were, they could see the faith that these guys expressed. And by the way, I want you to know this. I don't think that faith was just on the part of those buddies of his. I think there was a lot of faith expressed in him. How many of you all let four of your friends let you down on a cot through the roof? Climb up on top of a building, drag you up there. All along, you can almost hear him say, hey, listen, guys. Are you sure about this? I mean, come on. Hey, buddy, you got the palsy. It doesn't get much worse. Yeah, I know. I know. I got it. I got it. But even his faith is expressed. When Jesus says when he saw their faith, He's not just talking about the faith of the four. He is talking about the faith of them all. I see their faith. I see who they are. Here's four guys that care so much for their buddy that they want him to meet Jesus firsthand because they have met Jesus firsthand. They know who he is. They know what he can do. And man, whatever it takes, we want him to see Jesus. I got to ask you a question. What do you believe about Jesus Christ? Do you believe and trust in what he can do in people's lives so much that you'll do anything it takes to introduce him to people, to bring people to him? They were so convinced that they did whatever it took. If we truly had that kind of faith, I wonder what we could accomplish. If we truly had that kind of faith, I wonder what might happen. You know, I, I think about people in my life that have had that kind of faith. My mom and dad. I'm a child of God, I believe with all my heart, because of the faith and commitment of my mom and dad. They did not waver. When church doors were open, we were there. When there was something going on, we were there. They talked about Jesus Christ in our home. I knew who he was. I heard about him every single solitary day of my life. I've heard my mom praying for me. I've heard my dad praying for me. And I have to tell you, when I hear that, and when I see that, and when their lives are a testimony that my dad did not preach from the pulpit something that he didn't live at home. Amen. I've seen my dad get so convicted about things he preached in the pulpit that he'd leave the pulpit and go down on the altar and pray about it because he realized that God had dealt with his heart. Folks, understand and know this. That there are people in your life that care about you. And they care about you so much that they're willing to do anything and everything to bring you to Jesus Christ. You know, I'm convinced that even here today, there are a lot of folks that probably already know Christ. You've come because a friend has invited you, and we appreciate that. Man, you just have no idea how much we appreciate that. But there might be some of you all here today who have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it might be that there is a point in a time here where you recognize that, listen, the only hope I have is in Jesus Christ. If I were to die today, would I die without him? And by the way, we've got no guarantee as to the number of years we live. Amen. Amen. I was telling somebody just the other day, I preached 11 funerals this year already, 11 funerals. And I've preached funerals all the way from uh, a nine-year-old up until a 90-something-year-old and everything in between. But you've got no guarantee <laughs> well, we can leave this earth tomorrow. I tell them this all the time because I think it's an important thing. We, we have a false hope yes, sir. Yes, sir. that we build around, our lives around. Yeah. And it's this. 
We have the idea that the people that we love, the people we care for, the people sitting next to us, we have no illusion of thinking we're going to live for, I mean, not die. We, we, we have no illusions of that. We, nobody here thinks you're not going to face death or something of that nature. But we expect to wake up tomorrow next to that person sitting with us. We don't expect them to die overnight. We don't expect them to, you know, to die in the near future. We expect them to be right here with us. And we live our lives according to that. Never thinking that, you know what, this could be the last moment. My mom, I talk to my mom every Sunday morning. And she was sharing with me this week a, a family that I know personally, that there are friends that attend uh, church down there. And his wife had fallen down and she had had a neck brace forever. And... Then she got COVID. She had just all kinds of, of things. Finally, she got all better, got the neck brace off. First Sunday with the neck brace off was last Sunday. And she came to church with the neck brace off. Man, she was just, here's the way they described it. She was in high spirits. Oh, she was happy as a lark. She greeted everybody. They all hugged her. Boy, it was, it was sure good to see her back with them that morning, you know. And man, it was such a great thing. Her and her husband, you know, they got in the car. She's waving to people. I'll be back tonight. See you at church tonight. Got in the car, driving home. This is the way he described it. Said she took, they were talking about church and how much they enjoyed it. And all of a sudden, she took two deep breaths and just fell forward. By the time he turned around, got to the hospital, which was only three minutes away, she was dead. We don't know. We assume. Folks, they're just going to be with us forever. Folks, I got to tell you, this forgiveness issue, I don't want to stand before God without having been forgiven of my sins. I don't want to stand before God. When we think about the fact that folks are going to die, people I love, people I care for, I do not want to stand before God unforgiven. Jesus says this in John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The fact is, these men were not going to stop at anything. But when it came to getting their friend to Jesus. Uh, I, I'm sharing a lot of stories I've shared with my church, but they'll bear with me on these. But last trip I made to a, on a mission trip to Jamaica, we were there. And, and every day we went to the church, we were building a, a parsonage. But at the same time, we were, this was actually the first trip that I made there. We were, um, we'd have services in the evening and that kind of thing. And all day long, the church was open. And, well, they didn't have doors, so it was always open. And so these, these ladies, every day, while we were building, they'd come and they'd be kneeling at the altar. They'd leave somewhere around noon, then they'd come back again, and they'd leave about 4 or 5 o'clock every day. And I asked the pastor, I said, <clears throat> what's going on with them? I mean, what's, what, what are they praying about? Do you know? He goes, oh, yeah. He says, they've been doing this ever since they heard you guys were coming because they knew you'd be preaching every night. And That one lady, the one right there, pointed to her and said, her sister doesn't know Christ, and she's gotten into a lot of things, and they're really concerned about it, and they're afraid. She's going to get into something that's going to cost her her life, and she's going to die without Christ. And they're praying for her. I said, no kidding. Man, I thought, what commitment. Every day these ladies came and did that. One of the services, I wasn't the one preaching, but one of the services we were there and the, the man preaching was preaching and man, she, this lady comes down the altar just, I mean, bawling. I mean, she's crying. She can't hardly get to the altar fast enough. Falls down uh, right on her face on the floor. Didn't even make it to the steps. She's laying right on the floor. And the pastor comes over and he's witnessing to her and talking to her. And these other ladies back there start getting all excited and they're shouting and carrying on and their hands are, are flailing, you know, and they're getting all crazy. And this woman jumps up and she just looks at her sister. She goes, I did it. And they come running down and grabbed her. That was the sister they'd been praying for to come to know Jesus Christ. That's friends. The friends that have invited you today are friends that want the best for you. They want something incredible for you. They want you to have the relationship with Jesus Christ that they have. The focus of these men was on bringing their friend to Jesus and make sure 
that he came, with, came in contact with him so that something could change in his life. When Jesus saw their faith, and not simple faith, but this kind of faith, I want you to imagine what his response may have been when they told him that they were going to tear a hole in the roof and, and lower him down to Jesus, this guy laying on the cot. He, he's like, okay, this must be a really important thing. This must be a really important thing. <coughs> the last thing I want you to see is this. Jesus' greater concern, rather than the palsy, was for forgiveness. He's concerned about your life. Don't get me wrong. Jesus is concerned if you're troubled with your finances. Jesus is concerned if you're having marital issues. Jesus is concerned if you're having some sickness. He's concerned about those things. But I'm here to tell you the greater concern is your eternity. He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now I want you to notice that was the first priority. That came before anything else. You need to be saved. You need to have eternal life. You need to know that when you leave this world, you can be with me for all eternity. Amen. Often people are more concerned about the physical. I'll be honest, a lot of churches are getting kind of caught up in that these days. It's called prosperity doctrine. And what they're trying to say is, listen, claiming that God can make you wealthy, healthy, famous, and wise, and everything else, I'm going to tell you, the focus is on the wrong things. We're not here to please your flesh. Please your old body. We're here to please your soul, that which is eternal. And that is to introduce to you Jesus Christ. We want you today to know him and to trust him. May your sins be forgiven. And here is the thing. When Jesus told him his sins were forgiven, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to steal a little line from a pastor friend of mine. It's immediate. It's instantaneous. It's miraculous. And you can become a child of God. Not something you got to wait for. You become what God would have you to be immediately. Our faith in Jesus Christ to forgive, to have our sins forgiven. How much of our life will be affected by forgiveness? A lot. Change who we are, change how we think, change a lot of things about us. You know what's interesting? It doesn't take away the sentence, of, it doesn't take away the sentence. It just takes it from you to Christ. Jesus pays the penalty. I'm still guilty. I, I was guilty until Jesus paid my penalty. I didn't do anything to pay for my sins. Jesus Christ did it for me. But because of that, I am now at liberty. I don't have to stand before that judge. I don't have to deal with that. My sins are forgiven. And it's a simple thing. Romans 10, 9 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. As we prepare for a song of invitation, I want to share this thought with you. A friend cared enough to bring you today, cared enough for you to say, I want to know, I want you to be sure, I just want you to be sure that you know Jesus Christ, and if you left this world, that you'd spend eternity in heaven. They just want you to know that, to be sure of that. And so today, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today, if you've never done that, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, if you've never sought him to forgive you of your sins, today, he can do that. If you allow him to do that, he'll do that today. He wants so badly to do that. He went to the cross for you. You want eternity? You want eternal life? It can only be found in Jesus Christ. Bow your heads with me for a moment, if you wouldn't mind. With all your heads bowed, nobody looking around, I'm going to ask you, if you're here today, nobody looking, just me. If there's anyone here today and you're looking at your life and you realize I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I know if I were to die today, I'd probably spend eternity in hell. I'm going to ask you, and I'm not going to come back and embarrass you. I'm not going to do any of those things, but I really, really want to know to pray for you. Can I ask you to slip up your hand? Nobody will see it but me. Anybody at all. And I promise I won't single you out, but I do want to pray for you. Anybody at all. There might be some folks here that maybe you're just wrestling with some things in your life. You know Christ. You've trusted him but you also realize you're not really living for him as closely as you should. 
Maybe today's the day you say, God, I need to get closer to you. <coughs> I need to be more of what you want me to be. Can you lift up your hand? And by that, you just say and pray for me. Amen. I see those all over the place. Thank you. Dear Father, Lord God, we love you. We thank you for what you do. I ask, Lord, that you'll be with us during this time of invitation, speaking to hearts and lives, that we might see the decisions made, made for you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray.